Welcome to the roundtable about unbiased health solutions for the future. As you know, uh, everything, unfortunately, is biased um, because we are always talking and working from a specific place. So, for a long time, we thought that medical solutions, health research is neutral, unbiased. Well, the last 30 years, a lot of researchers have worked to identify that there is very often a gender bias, uh, because we are thinking that women, we thought that women are just uh, smaller examples of men. Um, there were differences in treatment, in diagnosis, in symptoms that we're not always taking into account. Now there is another issue coming in, which is the digital, the technical revolution. And there might be new biases, but also a lot of opportunities. So we are going to talk about unbiased health solutions for the futures with our uh, great speakers. So I have the pleasure to welcome Mrs. Sakiko Fukudu Par. Uh, who is Professor of International Affairs, New School and Co-Director at the Collective for the Political Determinants of Health at the University of Oslo. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, we also have Professor Firdusi Kadri, Senior Scientist and Head, Mucosal Immunology and Vaccinology Unit, Infectious Diseases Division, the International Center for the Royal Disease Research. Thank you very much. And um, on the screen, um, we see uh, Professor Andrew Horn, Professor of Gynecology and Reproductive Sciences, University of Edinburgh, and co-director of EXPECT Center for Pelvic Pain and Endometriosis. Hello, Andrew. Thank you Hi. for being Hi. with us. And uh, Ms. May Young, Vice President, uh, Innovative Healthcare Solutions, Global uh, Happy Life Technology. So, um, Andrew, uh, let me start with you. Um, you are working on an issue, uh, Andrew, uh, metriosis, that we know is an issue that was for a long time um, not really considered treated, identified. So can you explain to us a little bit how that has changed in the last year, what it is about, and how gender bias might have played a role in this? Um, endometriosis, for those of you who don't know, and I hope everybody knows a bit about it now, because we've, we've spent a, a long time trying to raise awareness um, about this condition. It's, it's where there's tissue like the lining of the womb, outside of the womb, commonly within the pelvis. Um, but the big problem with it is it's associated with pain, often very debilitating pain. Um, the challenges that we've uh, faced with endometriosis have been um, around, first of all, lack of awareness. Um, and this in turn has led to um, a long time from when a, a patient with the condition presents with symptoms uh, to being diagnosed, and that's estimated to anything between seven uh, to eight years. Uh, the other challenge that we have is we're very limited with regard to the, the treatments uh, available. These are broadly uh, broken down into hormone treatments and treatments to remove uh, the disease. Um, I think to, to answer your, your question about why we're in this situation now and what's happening now, um, it's been largely because this has been seen as a, a women's condition. It's not been talked about. It's an in, invisible condition, if you like, because it's a pain condition. So it's suffered uh, for these reasons. Um, and I think the lack of awareness around it has meant that maybe patients presenting with painful symptoms, maybe their friends, their families have maybe said, not been able to differentiate when normal is not normal. And similarly, when they've gone to see medical uh, professionals, they've perhaps not been well enough informed uh, to, uh, to pick out the diagnosis or, and to move forward with investigations and treatment. Um, the one positive thing I would say is because of a, a huge push around awareness, both with the public and amongst uh, medical professionals, we've seen big changes, I would say, certainly in the last five years. So that's fantastic, but there's still a lot more to do. Um, th th these changes are also related because we talk more openly, certainly, about gender bias, about, uh, uh, about issues that concern women, about sexism also. That has accelerated uh, the possibilities uh, of doing research on this issue, of finding new treatments. 
I, I think so. I mean, I think women's health issues are talked about a lot more. I think funders are much more um, concerned about ensuring that there's equality in uh, the division of you know the, the finances into women's health issues. But I still find it very challenging. I mean, for example, the, these figures, I think, are about five years old now. But in the States, for a condition like diabetes, which is as common in women as something like endometriosis, there's still 35 times the investment um, into diabetes compared to endometriosis. And I think this is largely because it is a condition that affects both sexes. Um, and I think that sort of thing needs to change. So how is digital technologies uh, coming into uh, diagnosis and, and, uh, and uh, better, better treatments? So I think um, digital health can help in a number of ways. I mean, it helps, um, as, as I'm sure the, the panel know, in terms of making clinical trials uh, easier and, and perhaps cheaper and quicker uh, to run. Um, Digitalisation helps with uh, patient um, identification, uh, recruitment and retention into trials because you can use uh, social media. There are obviously challenges with making sure you use appropriate language and make sure it's accessible to, to different genders, different uh, groups. Um, I think uh, the other point is around uh, data collection. Um, obviously, when, if you're working with women, as, as I do, young women, you want to minimalise the number of hospital visits, for example. So using things like apps, using wearable tech like smart watches can be helpful in collecting uh, data. Um, specifically around endometriosis in terms of changing clinical care, um, as well as trials around new treatments and using these sort of dis digital um, aspects, which I talked about. Um, I think what we really need to do is be able to um, use uh, digital means to collect huge amounts of data around uh, symptoms to be or in order to maybe pot potentially develop al algorithms, identify patterns uh, which could help with the diagnosis of the conditions. So, uh, Professor Kadri, um, how does this resonate with your work in the field and on the ground? What opportunities digital and technology bring to you? Uh, thank you for this question because I was very uh, excited to hear what is happening for endometriosis, which is a problem everywhere. I would say digital health in my field is extremely important if I talk about all the vaccine work I'm doing, about the disease surveillance, the disease burden. I mean, uh, let me talk about Bangladesh, since I'm Bangladeshi. So for us, it's an important agenda now. And so it's digital health for all by 2021, which I'm sure will not be possible. But there's been steps all over. Um, in my field, uh, the surveillance data that we are doing on cholera or the government data that's emerging every now and then. We have a management information system, very strong, that was from the last 10, 15 years. Now, these are very important things, but also digital health is trying to get across to the country at different levels, which is very important for me when I want to think about cholera, typhoid, and when I want to talk, talk about COVID. So I need to know what's happening all over the country. And so, we have electronic uh, systems that are becoming available. So uh, the whole health system is now being pushed towards to the very periphery of the country, like through community health clinics. And through those things, there are every community health clinic also has um, internet access. They have internet access and the community health workers at the very lowest level of reaching the people have Android tabs and they get the data and that's uploaded and then goes into the MIS. If I just take the example of COVID, I know have, now we have a system that's called Shurokha that I know how many people are infected, at least how many are getting tested, I can just go there. There's data on vaccine, that 10% or 14% of the people are getting vaccine. Everything that's coming is going into the MIS system and is being uploaded. So there are dashboards. So di these digital health information systems are very important and more so because of what's happening lately. Nothing is perfect, but it's started and it's being used. There's a family planning uh, uh, phone number, digitalization. So you can call and you can talk, and this was not available earlier. So everything needs to be improved, but it has started, it's being used. So telemedicine, 
uh, during these last two years has been used a lot and it's becoming like people are becoming used to the apps on this, not even smartphones, on the ordinary phones they can have access. Do you think it might be even easier to get them to, to contact a doctor, to get in touch than uh, it was before? Or it is just a new way uh, adding on? I think uh, when you look at the doctor to 170 million ratio, it's very bad. It's very, very poor. But telemedicine makes you come closer. It's not perfect at all, but it's another, another digitalization that is becoming very useful. Thank you very much. May, um, Happy Life is a, a digital technology company. Uh, and uh, uh, so how do you see, uh, particularly in China, but also globally, uh, the potential of digital technology for women's health? I'm so glad to, to hear um, our colleagues here about the, the digital health, about how we can leverage uh, technology to Im improve healthcare. Actually, that's the really um, the, the technology, the AI, the machine learning are, are really running our blood because we're a data science company. We're one of the pioneer company within China. What we have been doing the past few years is really to leverage the, the big data and the the um, AI technology to, to improve healthcare. So um, we have actually worked on, on several um, systems, very like what um, Dr. Borne had discussed about how to use the data to help improve the clinical development, let's say finding the patients from the, the medical um, electronic medical record and help recruit patients, help the study and uh, using algorithm, using modeling to predict uh, which are the most uh, relevant targeted population or which are the most uh, uh, effective treatment. Those uh, kind of questions can all be addressed using big data, using uh, technology, machine learning, and some other algorithm. Uh, we have you all working on that. I think this type of technology definitely is very powerful tools to be able to improve the efficiency of doing research and also to be able to uh, help the researcher and also help the pharma companies to develop the medication uh, quicker to get the, the, the medication which has the most MI need to the patients more uh, efficiently and uh, make it affordable because I think the affordability is a really big issue in China as well as globally. Thank you very much. Um, so we see that there are a lot of opportunities related to technology, data, um, digital. Uh, but uh, Professor Sakiku Fukuda, part you also talk about risks because what we have seen. Uh, already during the festival, how much bias is also in the development of uh, artificial intelligence, just 22% of researchers in artificial intelligence are women, bias is always coming in. So what are the risks uh, that you see uh, from your perspective of working a lot on, on this issue? Well, I like to think of it as technologies being very powerful instruments for improving human lives. Um, but the, the impact that technology has, you know, whether it's digital or artificial intelligence or whatever, depends on the purpose for it, which it, it is to put, and ultimately on the way that it is designed and developed and deployed. But um, there are consequences in terms of in fact, worsening inequality, gender inequality, social inequalities. And there are a lot of um, uh, issues uh, about um, uh, misuse and uh, human rights threats and ethical issues. And uh, for example, with respect to telemedicine, uh, it can be a wonderful tool, but the access to it is very much driven by the digital divide. and um, and whether it works or not, I think, depends very much on the social context within which it is, uh, it is uh, used. Uh, like there's a study uh, looking at um, uh, telemedicine, um, a project in uh, Ghana and uh, India, one, uh, M Health. And basically, 
you know, women in uh, the rural areas, particularly uh, in lower income uh, groups, don't have access to even a normal smartphone. And often there is a, or even just a, a, a telephone, a, a telephone is a mobile phone is shared within the family. And you know that the household is a site of patriarchy and um, the control over this phone is uh, often in the hands of the, uh, the, the male. It then becomes a kind of a site of contestation where women who are being given these, uh, this advice by telephone uh, to follow their pregnancy um, are often then given advice that um, is not contextualized um, to the, the, the local uh, traditions and, and culture. So it been, hasn't been designed in a sort of a participative way with a local community, giving advice that goes contrary to um, local traditions and without an explanation of why new practices like how to feed your baby and so forth might differ from what your family had done before. So, there are these recommendations and a lot of discussion about how the design has to be, has to take account of these social contexts. And that if you don't do that, it's not just that, well, you know, you have one person who might get a benefit from it and another who doesn't, but the overall social impact is actually um, exaggerating, amplifying these uh, inequalities that exist. Yeah, so you say there are three, uh, three elements. It's design, development, and deployment, because they're in every phase there are risks. And so um, are these uh, are this kind of technologies uh, developed in a participatory manner uh, in order to take into account uh, all the elements? Does this resonate with you, Professor Kadi? I don't think it has developed in that way yet and gender has not been taken into account so much. Now, while you were talking, I was thinking about the data policy. There may be so many things gender-related that needs to be uh, confidential because a woman is now going for telemedicine, is talking to these uh, different, getting into these different apps and talking about things, and she, if she doesn't even have her own personal phone, she wouldn't like her partner, her husband, her family, her in-laws to know what she's doing. I think those, the data policy is still not there. The thinking behind the differences between the male and the female, I mean, the needs is still uh, being processed because this uh, the needs to be there. So thinking about what you said just now, I feel that it's very, very important to have the confidentiality, the data policy in place, and to also tailor make it more to the need of the woman. I mean, men can go out to many clinics and get a lot, but the woman inside the home with her child, for the child and for herself, consider endometriosis. If that becomes available, as women suffer so much all over the world. So I think it has to be tailor made to gender needs. Do you have the impression that, because I, I, what I hear is that we see and have opportunities with digital and technology, we put them out, and then we try to correct the negative effects. <laughs> so do you think we are still in that stage, or more and more people think about design for taking into account when you design all other gender and inequality issues? Well, I, I think there is, but I think a lot more awareness needs to be given. But I think there are other kinds of, of risks um, that have to do with a broader social impact. I mean, you talked about the confidentiality of the information that is given and data breach, data privacy. These are human rights issues that we know uh, exists and it is not the doctor or the clinician that is it, it at stake. It's the way in which this digitalized data then becomes owned and mined and exploited for other purposes. And I think we quickly then have to consider what kinds of governance systems that, that we have. Uh, the governance of this sort of data is still very much um, 
in, in infancy. I mean, it is basically a kind of a unregulated space. We also have this problem that there is this sense of um, techno-optimism, you know, seeing technology as a silver bullet that will solve all problems and unquestioningly seeing that all of the technological design has been scientifically verified. And you take something like the um, mobile telephone uh, apps for um, tracing contacts of people during, um, during COVID, and, you know, many, many studies uh, have been done on this, and, you know, reviews of these studies show that there's very thin evidence at best that these, uh, these telephone apps actually produce accurate information. So there is this responsibility to be much more rigorous, this responsibility to be much more careful about the social impact of, um, of these, these devices. But still innovating because technology and digital offer incredible opportunities. How is the debate uh, in the UK mm. about the, the, the risks related to the opportunities of uh, digital technology health solution? So, so I think uh, similar to other members of the panel, the big issue is around uh, trust. I think uh, certainly working in research, people are still scared about offering up their their, their data, um, exposing themselves to, you know, to to industry stealing their data, those sorts of things. Um, I, so I think I think working to to ensure that people understand that their data is only going to be used for specific uh, projects. So um, the big bit of work I think that we have to do is around um, consent and ensuring that patients fully understand who has access to their data um, and that they're only giving permission for, for specific projects. The, the issue I suppose with that for, for me, for example, as a researcher is that projects change, you know, grow arms and legs, you, you identify new areas that you want to pursue. So um, if you have this fantastic volume of data that you've collected for a specific project, uh, you always want to have the opportunity to be able to use it um, again in other um, fields. So, so that's a challenge. Um, I think the, the other challenge is, certainly for me as a, as a researcher, is it's still, it's still not cheap to, to, to conduct studies like this. Um, uh, you want to con uh, conduct them at, at scale, and so these sorts of pieces of work um, require huge amounts of, of funding, and that still is a big challenge, particularly in women's health, where uh, funding seems to still be slightly uh, limited, certainly in the UK, and I think certainly uh, in the States and in Australia, I know that's the case as well. So, May, uh, you are very, very... Um optimistic, of course, uh, for the future. You have clients as a company. Do they ask you to do uh, take gender into account? Uh, Unfortunately, so far, I haven't got a request about the gender difference. Uh, in my previous work, there are some um, um, research looking into racial um, difference uh, in the States, because I used to work in the States for a long time. Um, most of my time working for uh, global pharma companies. Uh, and uh, um, I haven't really worked on any uh, women's health products before. So I think that's probably one of the reasons I haven't been exposed to, to any requests about uh, looking particular into uh, gender difference. Um, so I, I think, but I, I fully agree with the previous discussion about the uh, the, the data security, the patient privacy, which is very, very important. Uh, I think for regardless we're a pharma company or are a data science company, this is always our top priority to make sure we're following the compliance, we're, we're keeping the, uh, the privacy of the patients. That's, that's our, always our uh, priority. Um, but another another aspect I, I want to discuss a little bit is I feel um, another challenge or risk is about the data quality. Um, I think data quality is uh, is very um, 
like for China, especially for China, uh, compared to the more advanced country like uh, U.S. Or, or some European countries, is that the data quality and the, to a researcher, data quality is critical because we always believe garbage in, garbage out. Um, for a data science company, and when we do research, if the data quality is low, that means our, our research cannot be high quality research. And that has big impact to the results because say if we really want to uh, raise the awareness about women's health, women's MI need, we want to quantify it. We want to accurately, precisely quantify it. So then uh, we get the research done, we get published, we raise the voice. Um, but before that, we have to make sure our data quality is strong enough to uh, to support our statement of that MI need about that burden to women. Um, so, so we we at least for for our company, we have been fighting for really improve the, the data quality in China. We have been trying to uh, support our our clients as well. It's not only about pharma companies. It's also research institute. It's also patients, doctors, hospitals, to try to build up an ecosystem that we can share, we can share the knowledge, that we can connect everyone together in a system, that we can um, build up the system and then make the high quality data, make the high quality research to help um, patients to gain better access to the medication they need. Yeah, that's interesting and shows once again how systemic the issue is because the research has to be well designed, <laughs> taking into account uh, gender data uh, in order to have the right data quality to then have the right treatment. So it's a whole system that has to take into account gender and social uh, parameters. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for being with us uh, to talk about unbiased uh, health solutions in the future for women. Uh, and uh, thank you for being with us, and uh, I hope you enjoyed this roundtable.